Hello everyone and welcome back to Bio 181. In this lecture, we will be covering the topic of photosynthesis. We'll be building upon our knowledge from Chapter 7, Cellular Respiration. So before beginning this lecture, it would be handy to review that material. We've covered biomolecules and how cells can use biomolecules to harvest the energy stored in their bonds. But the origins of this energy are from photosynthesis. Yes, sunlight is used and energy is stored as chemical energy. Organisms that can harness sunlight in this way to store energy in biomolecular bonds are called autotrophs, where auto means self and troph means feeding. Examples of autotrophs include plants, algae, and some, but not all, prokaryotes. Organisms that need to harvest energy that were already stored in biomolecules by others are called heterotrophs. Heterotrophs break the bonds of biomolecules to harvest their energy. In this example, the root word hetero means other. Cellular respiration is a perfect example of heterotrophy, where a cell takes the energy already stored in biomolecules all animals are heterotrophs, all fungi are heterotrophs, and some, but not all, prokaryotes are heterotrophs. This food chain pyramid depicts the process of autotrophs, called producers, and transferring their energy to primary consumers, up the chain to secondary and tertiary consumers. The consumers are all executing heterotrophy in this pyramid. So to review, autotrophs take the sun's energy to create energy in chemical bonds. That is photosynthesis. Then heterotrophs take those chemical bonds and convert it to energy for their own needs. However, autotrophs aren't just charitable organisms. They create bi biomolecules to serve their own purposes. That may be their own structure for their own cells were also for energy storage to do work within their cells. Plants, for example, can do both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. In addition to chloroplasts, as discussed during endosymbiosis, they also have mitochondria and are fully capable of doing cellular respiration. While heterotrophs, like uh, monkeys, humans, etc., are only capable of the cellular respiration component. There are several types of producers capable of photosynthesis. There are the photosynthetic bacteria, and then the aquatic algae and land plants that went through a series of endosymbiosis with those photosynthetic bacteria to gain the property of photosynthet photosynthetic capabilities. Cyanobacteria are the primary source of photoautotrophy amongst bacteria, and their descendants, the chloroplasts and cells, are responsible for algae and plants' own photosynthetic capabilities. Here we can see there are many, many chloroplasts within a single plant cell that help accomplish this. As you can imagine, providing the world with energy stored in biomolecules, the biomolecules themselves, and making our atmosphere rich in oxygen is an incredibly important job for the Earth's ecosystems. For these reasons, it's important to understand in some detail how it is accomplished. Like mitochondria are highly focused on cellular respiration with their many cristae of their inner mitochondrian membrane, so too are chloroplasts of plants and algae. Like the electron transport chain, photosynthesis is membrane chemistry and the chloroplasts have evolved a complex membrane system to optimize its capacity to photosynthesize. Just like mitochondria, the chloroplast has an outer membrane, an intermembrane space, and an inner membrane. The inner cell is floating in a solution called the stroma, which would be similar to the mitochondrial matrix, but of a different name. However, they do not contain cristae. Instead, they have membranes inside the cell called thylakoids. These thylakoids are stacked into structures we call granum. Each granum 
is filled with its own aqueous solution called stroma. The granum is where most of the action happens with photosynthesis. Okay, so let's take a step back from the very small to the overall picture. All photosynthesis is, is the reverse process of cellular respiration. Energy plus six carbon dioxides and six waters are rearranged so that six oxygen molecules and sugar is synthesized. As a side note, we are repeatedly we repeatedly use sugar in all of these examples because sugar is going to be the most common intermediary between energy and biomolecules. For example, we run on sugar. Glucose is the predominant form and we convert glucose into energy. To a lesser degree, we as humans may use other biomolecules or convert them to sugar, but glucose is our main biomolecule for ATP creation. Let's now bring this full circle. By and large, consumers take sugar and oxidize it. Using oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor in aerobic cellular respiration in order to create energy, the byproducts of which are fully oxidized carbon and carbon dioxide, water, and energy to do work. Producers, or photoautotrophs, take energy from the sun and store its bonds by reducing carbon dioxide, creating the byproduct of oxygen and storing the energy as sugar or carbohydrates. Returning to our pathway map, let's hone in on the highlighted region starting from the very top with simple sugars. These sugars can be converted all the way along the highlighted region through glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation to create ATP. Note that this isn't the only pathway, and those same sugars can be used to make a variety of other structures. Moving around the ends of the image, starting at the top right, moving clockwise, we have nucleotide and protein metabolism. The bottom right is lipid metabolism. The bottom left for other vitamins and amino acids. And just above cellular respiration, we have photosynthesis. So we aren't limit, limited to just ATP creation. And these biomolecules can be fluid in their form and function through metabolic pathways to not just create ATP, but a variety of biomolecules. We can start with light and to give us those same simple sugars or divert intermediates to create other molecules and processes as well throughout the cell. So we've shown the overall balanced chemical equation, but just as we did with cellular respiration, we need to focus on the particular details. Photosynthesis has two main stages. The light dependent reactions are those that quite literally involve sunlight and occur along the thylakoid membranes. Because the light dependent reactions are membrane based chemistry, it will most similarly resemble oxidative phosphorylation of aerobic cellular respiration. The Calvin cycle uses the energy and electrons harvested in stage one to synthesize biomolecular compounds by simulating carbon dioxide. This process occurs in the stroma of a chloroplast. Before we talk about photosynthesis in more detail, we need to have a conversation about light. Light is a really interesting phenomenon because it can be thought of as, a, as being a wave or as discrete particles called photons. A light's wave has a peak and a trough. The distance between one peak to the next peak or simultaneously one trough to the next is called the wavelength, abbreviated with the Greek sign lambda. A light wave has velocity of about 300 million meters per second. That's how fast light travels. The frequency 
is how frequent the peaks pass along a certain point. As you can imagine, the shorter the wavelength is, if that wave travels at the same speed as a longer wavelength, then the number of peaks that pass a certain point will be more frequent than if the wavelength was longer. Um, they take, take more time, even though the wave was moving at the same speed, if the wavelengths are much longer to cross a certain point. And so there's going to be a relationship between the two. The faster this wave moves along, or the shorter the wavelengths, the more peaks cross a point in a given amount of time, and therefore, the higher the frequency. Not all light is equal in energy. Again, wavelength is the distance between two peaks or two troughs. Frequency is how often a peak or trough occurs. So here we can see these kangaroos are traveling at the same speed. Uh, the wavelength at the top one is a lot shorter, and therefore the frequency is a lot faster. The lower the wavelength and higher the frequency, the more energetic the light is. This is very important. The lower the wavelength, or the smaller the wavelength, and higher the frequency, the more energetic the light is. So which of the two kangaroos has the higher energy wave? And how do you know this? And this gets to the crux of our discussion here where wavelength and frequency are inversely related. <clears throat> okay, the speed of light is constant meaning that regardless of what kind of light we are talking about, it all travels at the same speed in a vacuum. However, frequency and wavelength can vary. Frequency multiplied by wavelength of the light always is going to equal the speed of light. So there's a mathematical relationship here. Since the speed of light won't change, for a given wave, for a given light, the bigger the wavelength, the smaller the frequency has to be so that when we multiply them together, we get the same speed for light. And conversely, the bigger the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. This formula doesn't need to be memorized, but the principle that frequency and wavelength is inversely related needs to be understood. Particular wavelength and frequency determines the type of light. The shorter the wavelength, higher the frequency, and additionally the larger the energy. The shortest wavelengths and highest frequencies are the gamma rays. The largest wavelengths and lowest frequencies are radio waves. Somewhat in the middle is the visible life spectrum. This spectrum is relevant in the conversation of photosynthesis because this spectrum is what is harvested to do photosynthesis. Blue light spectrum has the shortest wavelength in this, in this area, and red light has the largest wavelength. Checkpoint one. Which color of light is more energetic? A, blue, B, green, C, yellow, or D red. When certain molecules are hit by a photon of light, their electrons become excited. When excited, electrons jump from a closer orbital to a farther orbital. Remember from chapter two that the farther an electron is from the nucleus, the more energy it has. Electrons there can store a larger amount of energy and are more reactive. In photosynthesis, the electrons that are excited by light are part of pigment molecules. Here is the pigment molecule chlorophyll A. These pigment molecules, given that name because they have color, are large organic molecules with a lot of electron mobility. Uh, 
so the electrons can move around quite easily between the atoms of the molecule. The antennae of the pigment molecule act as a light rod for photons. Electrons in the antennae get excited and then are passed down the antennae to the reaction center, which is the magnesium in the center. Plants pigments have certain preferences for the types of visible light they can absorb. Chlorophyll A is the main pigment. Chlorophyll B and carotenoids are an accessory pigment. You would be familiar with carotenoids, which give the colors, the red colors of tomatoes, uh, the orange colors of carrots. The wavelength of light absorbed depends on the available energy levels to which an excited electron can be boosted in that particular pigment molecule or atom. For example, chlorophyll A, we can see that the solid line has two main wavelengths that are absorbed in the blue and red spectrum. In the middle of the graph, we can see very little of light with that wavelength is used by these three common pigments in photosynthesis, which is why plants appear a green or greenish yellow color. So now we know that light energy is absorbed, mostly in the blue, orange, and red spectrum, and excites electrons into a state where they have high energy and are unstable. And all of this is important when it comes to understanding the light-dependent reactions. In the light-dependent reactions, the kinetic energy of the sun is captured via pigments and converted into chemical energy, ATP and NADPH. Here is a close-up of the proteins and reactions involved in the light-dependent reaction of the thylakoid. This should all look very familiar to you since we just covered aerobic cellular respiration. We'll get into more detail, but some commonalities to cellular respiration are the transfer of electrons and protons, membrane-bound proteins that pump protons across the membrane and move electrons along the membrane, and the production of ATP via a proton gradient using ATP synthase and the compound similar to NAD+, called NADP+. Two heavy guns in this chain are photosystem 2 and 1. These are clusters of transmembrane proteins attached to pigment molecules that absorb the energy of sunlight. PS2 is where the uh, photosystem chain here begins. PS2 is the first photosystem in the chain. Don't be confused. It's only named number two because it was the second photosystem to be discovered. The pigment molecules in PS2 act as a funnel, passing the excited electrons from light down to plastoquinone, PQ. Electrons lost from PS2 are replaced by the oxidation of water, producing oxygen as we can see here on the far left. The B6F complex receives electrons from PQ and uses their energy to pump protons from the stroma to the thylakoid, then passes them to plastocyanin. Plastocyanin transfers the electrons to photosystem 1, PS1. By this time, the electrons are almost spent of free energy and must be re-excited by another photon. The re-excited electrons are transferred from PS1 to ferrodoxin and then to NADP reductase, which uses them to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. NADP plus is an electron carrier, just like NAD plus and FAD plus that we learned about in cellular respiration.
Protons from the thylakoid diffuse down their concentration gradient into the stroma through ATP synthase, which uses their flow to create ATP. Point two, review the previous slides. What are the three main products, excluding protons, of the light dependent reactions? Checkpoint three, which three parts of the overall equation for photosynthesis are either produced or consumed in the light dependent reactions? And checkpoint four, photosystem two optimally absorbs light at 680 nanometer wavelength. Photosystem one optimally absorbs light at 700 nanometers. Which of these two is higher in energy? Okay, so that summarized the first phase of photosynthesis. Let's move to phase two. In the Calvin cycle, short-term chemical energy and electrons, as ATP and NADPH, are converted into long-term energy storage molecules like glucose. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast. Brace yourselves because we're going to get into much greater detail about the Calvin cycle than we did with the citric acid cycle of cellular respiration. Let's focus at the top of the cycle where we can see CO2 enters the system and at the bottom glucose is created. We can slice up the Calvin cycle into three main processes. At the top, we have stage one, carbon fixation. This is where carbon dioxides are fixed to organic compounds. Carbon dioxide reacts with ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, uh, shortened and abbreviated as RUBP, to create 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PGA. Moving clockwise, we next have stage 2 reduction. This is where the organic compounds are reduced. And glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P, is produced to go on to become glucose. Lastly, stage three is the regeneration of ribulose bisphosphate. Now, looking back around the circle again, stage one takes ATP for fixation. Stage two takes NADPH for reduction. And stage three takes ATP for regeneration. We'll kick things off with stage one, carbon fixation. Three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate react with three molecules of CO2 to produce six molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. There will be a bit more detail in the slides than you need. You do not need to memorize all of it, but for each stage, you need to keep track of three things. What is the starting material and ending material? Is ATP consumed? Is NADPH consumed? So, stage one, step one. Ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, RUBP, is readily available in the stroma. CO2 attaches to RUBP, then water and a proton are used to split this six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules called 3-phosphoglycerate. So far, no energy inputs have been required. The first step of carbon fixation is catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco, which stands for ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Stage two is the reduction phase. Three, the three phosphoglycerate is reduced with the use of both ATP and NADPH to generate another high energy molecule called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. The 
Stage three has two paths. Both include further processing of our molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate made in the previous step. One molecule leaves the system to go on to make biomolecules like glucose for the cell. The other five glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates need to be kept in the cycle so that more ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate can be regenerated to continue carbon fixation of newly entering CO2. The end result, though, is that three carbon dioxides enter the system and one reduced three-carbon molecule called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, G3P, exits the system. Let's walk through the general steps of stage three, regeneration. Five molecules of G3P are turned back into three molecules of ribulose bis 15 bisphosphate using 3 ATP. This is necessary in order to be able to continue fixing CO2 during future cycles. G3P has three carbon atoms, and RUBP has five carbon atoms. Five molecules of G3P can be recycled into three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate. Six molecule of G3P is not used for ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate regeneration. This molecule is what the cell obtained by using 6 NADPH and 9 ATP. If you count the carbons in glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, you will note there are three. Therefore, it will take two complete Calvin cycles to generate enough reduced carbon for one glucose molecule that has six carbons in it. This slide shows a detailed version of all of the reactions. So we took actually a very broad view of the cycle, um, but for our purposes, be familiar with each stage and the three items you need to be tracking for each stage. Checkpoint five. What is the name of the stage and the enzyme that fixes CO2 to ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate? The first step of carbon fixation is catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. Ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. It has multiple subunits as seen by the different colorations in the image, the protein image of the, of the protein. And it's not an easy task to fix CO2, which has very low, which is very low in energy and replace the bonds with high energy bonds. It's an uphill battle. Additionally, enzymes aren't always perfect little worker bees. Sometimes they accidentally lower the activation energy for the wrong reactions and allow the wrong reactions to occur. Rubisco is the abbreviation for the full name of the enzyme, which is ribulose 15 bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Recall when we discussed enzymes that anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Here we can see that it is a carboxylase, meaning that it fixes carbon, but it is also an oxygenase, meaning that sometimes it latches molecular oxygen to ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate instead. This process is called photorespiration. So we can imagine carbon dioxide and molecular oxygen bouncing around in the cell. And when a carbon dioxide bumps into Rubisco and ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, then we're happily fixing CO2. However, if we look at the yellow colored cycle of photorespiration, when oxygen bumps into Rubisco and ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, then we've consequently spent a ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate and now the cell has to use ATP and NADPH just to regenerate the ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate to start over again. The cell does what it can to favor the Calvin cycle over photorespiration. For example, the more CO2 is inside of a cell compared to O2, 
the more rubisco is more likely to fix CO2. If there is more oxygen compared to CO2 in the cell, the more likely the rubisco will attach oxygen to ribulose bis, uh, 1,5 bisphosphate. Plants can't totally get rid of their oxygen because it is made during photosynthesis with the splitting of water, and they also need it to perform cellular respiration. Overall, photorespiration decreases the efficiency of photosynthesis by consuming molecules of ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate that are not used productively for glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate production. In general, for every four carboxylation reactions with ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, one RUBP is oxidized. The higher the concentration of CO2 compared to O2, the more effective the cell is at carbon fixation of rubisco, the more vents of CO2 bumping into rubisco and ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate. However, the lower the ratio of CO2 to oxygen, the lower the photosynthesis efficiency. At higher temperatures, rubisco becomes even less efficient. Plants have what are called stomata on their surfaces. Stomata, coming from the Greek word for mouths, are little pores that can open and close and let gas exchange occur inside of the plant. When their surrounding environment gets hot and dry, the plants have to close their stomata in order to reduce evaporation and dehydration. As you can imagine, this causes an imbalance because photosynthesis is making oxygen and that oxygen is trapped. While CO2 is prevented from entering through the stomata. C3 carbon fixation is the direct method we've covered so far. CO2 is brought into a cell called the mesophyll cell where it is fixed using the Calvin cycle in plants. This is the most ancient evolutionary form and most susceptible to photorespiration for the reasons discussed on the last slide. The oxygen made from the light dependent reactions are brought in through the stromata and they can interfere with rubisco's carboxylation. Two plant groups have evolved workarounds to the issue of photorespiration. The first are the C4 plants, which include commercially important plants such as corn and sugarcane. C4 fixation initially uses a separate enzyme than uh, rubisco to fix CO2 to a separate molecule. This enzyme attaches CO2 to a three carbon molecule to make a four carbon molecule, which is where C4 plants derive their name. And this enzyme is not susceptible to oxidation like rubisco is and significantly reduces the chances of photorespiration. This image is a cross section of a C4 plant's leaf. The process of C4 synthesis still occurs in mesophylls, but the Calvin cycle is now delegated to a separate grouping of cells called the bundle sheath cells. They have what is called the Kranz anatomy, which comes from the German word for wreath. So CO2 is fixed to a three carbon organic molecule in mesophyll cells, resulting in a four carbon molecule that is shuttled to bundle sheath cells where the Calvin cycle is performed. There, the C4 molecule is decarboxylated. This active, active form of concentrating carbon dioxide in the bundle sheath cells increase, increases the amount of CO2 versus oxygen found there. Additionally, the light-dependent reactions occur exclusively in the mesophylls. 
so oxygen formation from this process is not built up in the same location as where the Calvin cycle is performed. The second group of plants that have formed a workaround to the issue are the CAM plants, CAM. CAM stands for uh, Crassulation Acid Metabolism, named after the plant family they were first discovered in, the Crassulaceae. Or the, or the succulents. Uh, CAM and C4 have both evolved independently on their own several times before. And so with CAM plants, we see a wide variety of different organisms cap capable of doing them in plants, such as cacti, succulents, pineapple, etc., etc. In fact, the saguaro are strictly CAM plants. They're only capable of performing CAM photosynthesis which makes them highly toler tolerable to our climate here in Arizona. Okay, so how does CAM plant, how, how does the CAM plant mechanism work? During the night, stomata open. CO2 enter, enters the cells and is fixed to a three carbon organic molecule. During the day, stomata close and the CO2 is released from the organic molecules, kept inside of the cells, and channeled directly into the Calvin cycle. This concentrates the amount of CO2 present during the daytime, while simultaneously allowing the stomata to remain closed, massively reducing evaporation through the stomata, and therefore dehydrating the plants. This slide summarizes the advancements in photorespiration in C4 and CAM plants. C4 uses a spatial solution. It separates oxygen formation and the light-dependent reactions in the mesophylls and carboxylation of the Calvin cycle to the bundle sheath cells. They also use the C4 compound to concentrate the amount of CO2 in the bundle sheath cells. CAM plants separate the steps of fixing CO2 and the other steps of CO2 temporarily or by time of day. At, at night, when the amount of evaporation is less, the stomata open up, and throughout the night, the plants are busy fixing CO2 to a temporary organic molecule, building up a reserve of carbon. Then, during the day, the stomata close, the CO2 is released from the molecule or decarboxylated and taken up in the Calvin cycle. We have a spatial solution in C4 plants and a temporal solution or a time-based solution in CAM plants. Checkpoint six. Some groups of plants have improved the efficiency of blank by reducing the rate of the competitive process known as blank. They do this through evolutionary adaptions that maximize the amount of blank and minimize the amount of blank in cells that perform the Calvin cycle. And that is the end of chapter eight, photosynthesis. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you during the next lecture.